Okay, welcome everybody. So we continue on the prediction of subset localization. And again, well, but now you have seen that. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, to repeat, by homology means that you infer from information that you get from a protein that is similar to it. The idea is there's an evolutionary relation. That's why from the sequence comparison you can infer similarity in some feature, function. De novo means you in fact use lookup information but you train a machine learning device and at the moment of the prediction you don't explicitly relate it to one particular protein with an evolutionary connection. Essentially this is similar. Okay, it's a in some sense it's a philosophical way uh, point because here you assume there's an evolutionary relation. Here you assume that you know that the machine learning device extracts something that ultimately is a similar signal. Up an issue in contrast is really the idea that you have a principle, a first principle, and that you can infer from a first principle. Uh, sun attracts Earth, for instance. Subcellular localization can be predicted by motifs, and I'm a little bit confused. Uh, yes, so this is just a repetition. Um, and in fact, I'd said there are two different types of motifs. The one that is sequential, but is such that when you look at a stretch of consecutive residues, you recognize the motif. Uh, signal peptides, I talked about in this context, and one is what you may call conformational. So only when the thing is folded in 3D, you recognize the motif on the three-dimensional object. On the level of the sequence, you just have isolated uh, stretches that together don't form a motif. There is a particular hierarchy of the pathway of the biological sorting mechanisms. And we talked about signal peptides. I talked about a uh, particular set of methods. There are many other methods. Uh, now, there are many other types of signal peptides. So the ones I talked about were the ones that get a protein secreted to the outside space. Okay? Uh, there's the same thing here in the chloroplast. Chloroplast is a compartment that you find only in plants. But it's a similar signal. It's similar in the sense that it's on one side of the protein, it has something hydrophobic, it has something charged, it has a cleavage side, so it is cut ultimately. But in detail it looks slightly different. That's why in fact you have to develop a known machine learning device on that particular set of signals. They're shorter, they look slightly different. So they have overall similar features, but in detail they look different. That's why there's a different machine learning device. There's something, and just because this is biology, one you call signal peptide, one you call transit peptide, and one you call targeting peptides, they're all the same in different compartments, and biologists just happen to love the words. Uh, that's mitochondria. And again, there's a method here, MITO-P, indicating already that again, you have a new machine learning device trained on this because you have a slightly different signal. But all of these essentially are similar in, in terms of the idea. It's something that is consecutive, it's something that is the beginning of the protein, and it's something that you can machine learn. So it's something relatively simple. All you need to do to capture these is to, have, to prepare a good data set. And in fact, all of these here started with Henrik Nielsen, uh, who is behind this data collection. So most of the work really went into the data collection. Target P is a combination of all three. And as very often, combinations are not always that simple. So the problem really is, OK, if you are secreted, it's clear you're not going to be in the chloroplast. But when you have a prediction that says chloroplast and signal peptide. How do you handle that? So if both methods give a strong signal for a positive signal. So this one says you have a chloroplast protein. This method says you have a protein that gets out in the outside space. So which one do you trust? And now the, the handshaking begins. So the one way in which you could do that is you say, well, I pick whatever is the highest probability in its prediction. So in this particular case, we have actually three different compartments, mit mitochondria also. They're not compatible either mitochondria or chloroplast or secreted. You cannot be all three of them or any uh, protein typically is not all three of them. So that's why they developed uh, another method, uh, target P, that sort of finds an average between those. But that is again, it's one of those situations, target P 
is the best possible compromise between the three, but it's actually when you know that you're not dealing with chloroplast because you're not looking at plants, for instance, uh, then it turns already out that this one here for particular proteins is better. So most users now today use that one. And that again has to do with how you I believe what we have to change, really, what you guys have to learn to change. My generation is still one where machine learning is something that you develop at once and it works for several years. Deep learning is the thing of the, the moment. So the machine learning methods that change themselves over time, that adjust. And part of deep learning, when you look at internet traffic, that's an immediate problem where you immediately see why deep learning is important, because the data is constantly changing. You constantly want to adjust the way you look at the data because what you, are want to, what you really want to learn from is recent data, and you don't want to forget all the old data. This balance is something that is really new and is something that will be important in your lives. This could also have helped here somehow dynamic systems that not only when you develop your method do you think about the user today. It's like in programming. When, when you program you have to think about making it as generic as possible. At the same time sometimes you need a hack in order to, to, to have a faster program. It's a little bit similar here. Uh, that was, let's call it, one hack. And maybe there is, a, there is a better method needed. It's a machine learning device. It's not, in that sense, a hack that it just looks at the highest probabilities. It's much more intelligent than that. Uh, in fact, there, there, there is a lot of logic going into this. Uh, ex experience, expertise. Uh, but still, this is something that, that people, as a problem, that people have to learn to do better. We, as a field, again. Now, one particular compartment here uh, that is different in this general picture where this is sort of everything that somehow goes towards secretion that goes outside the cell uh, is the nucleus. And that is a gated transport. So the exchange between the cytoplasm and the nucleus and there is the so-called nuclear localization signal. Briefly, that was mentioned when the IDP was presented. And Let's just resample the idea of the uh, nuclear localization signal. The nuclear localization signal is one that mm, somehow sits on, it lives in between these two words. I said a signal that is consecutive in sequence, this type, a signal that only you recognize when you form a 3D shape. Nuclear localization signals, some of them are like that, clearly. Some of them are in between because they are not a single residue, they are something that is sort of more consecutive, but you need another stretch from somewhere else coming together. Let me just show you some. The way it works, briefly, that really is the, the, the typical case of a zip code. So this protein has a localization signal. There's a protein, for instance, called importing. There are a couple of proteins known now that do that. Uh, transporting is another one. So when I did this slide, essentially there were only these two known. Today, there's a whole zoo of these that recognize this motif, the nuclear localization signal, NLS. Take the protein and shuttle it through the pore the hole in the nucleus, which in fact again is, an, is a protein, is a large protein that makes this pore, so-called transmembrane protein, uh, and puts it into the nucleus. Okay. Now, when we started our work, there is a database of these motifs called Procyte. Procyte simply collects motifs that people and experimentalists describe from their experimental work. Uh, they find that something makes this protein be important to the nucleus. They try to mutate residues to see what that something is, where the motif sits. And then they publish, ultimately from a couple of these papers, a Procyte motif. This particular Procyte motif, bless you. How exactly did they mutate the protein? So typically, now we get into the intuition of experimental biologists. They have some inkling to, this is a while ago, as you see in the date of the paper, that while ago making one particular variant, one particular mutation, did cost a lot of money still. And so they had to really think. And thinking is they, again, do the kind of sequence analysis we talked about last semester, where they look, what type of secondary structure do you have? Is it on the surface, that residue? Is it conserved? Is it something that a protein that is similar to it? Most likely that if you look at the protein in mouse and human, you know, you expect that most, both will be in the nucleus. 
So you want something that is conserved between them. So look for something that is on the surface so that it can be recognized by importing, something that is somehow conserved, and something that sort of looks like you believe it could be the motif. Mutate one residue. And hope that the experiment then will no longer show the protein to be in the nucleus. That's typically the way it works. And what I now describe, typically in, when we did this, was the work of a, more than a year. One variant. Okay? Uh, today they can do many, many more than that. And in fact they can do that like in uh, almost high throughput uh, variants. They can do it in high throughput for particular systems. But for proteins for which they still don't know much, it's still even more complicated. It's not as complicated as it was, but that's the way they do it. So the tools that we provide, and this particular tool that I will talk about now that was published here, uh, got a very high citation simply because experimentalists used it to design their invariants. And when they were successful, they simply cited us. Right? Okay, when we started. There was one in ProSite had uh, thousands of motifs, and one of them was a nuclear localization signal. It hit to 96 proteins that were no known to be nuclear, and it hit to 31 families. And of all the proteins it found to be uh, nuclear, 90% of those we knew are nuclear, 10% of those, of all the proteins for which we knew the localization, 90% were nuclear and 10% were not. Okay, so that's the uh, precision or accuracy. The coverage or uh, recall is only 3% because most nuclear proteins were not found. There's only one motif. Okay, so then the idea was, and this was like an IDP project uh, at Columbia University, not. Uh, Something in that uh, you could compare to what, what we do here as an IDP project it was a three month project, Murat um, Chokol. And the project simply was go to the literature and read papers because uh, Murat, so he was not a programmer. And so I needed to do something with him that didn't involve programming. He didn't know how to do that. So reading literature sounded like a, like a great project. And collect motifs that, hi, uh, that experimentalists have described in their papers. And here is one a subset of the list. Uh, this is the motif that experimentalists in some paper call, in some paper, the papers are cited here, call the nuclear localization signal, for which they have some data. And red are residues in, that are positively charged, so the K and R letters. Uh, so this is an X variable between seven and nine residues of any in between. And essentially, so you see a bunch of motifs. You see that there is a lot of red in there, 20 amino acids, two of them are KOR, so one in 10 would be the, the random probability. And you see this is much more than one in 10, the, the red. Visually, immediately appreciate that, right? Uh, in fact, there were even uh, more motifs. In some cases, you had the situation that was suppressed in the one before already. So you have a, uh, a bunch of positive, a bunch of positive with something in between. And that is like conformational. So this is very short here. This is very short. Maybe not enough to form a nuclear localization signal, but coming back together in 3D, they form exactly a local positive patch. Why is it important to be positive? DNA is negatively charged. Okay, that doesn't explain it. We get back into that uh, nonsense, what I said. So they're positively charged. Um, I, I'll get back to, back to why that makes sense, what I said. Um, good. Now, the idea was, can we test how well these motifs work? How would you do that? You cannot do it in bacteria because they don't have a that's a great idea. In fact, uh, this is we discarded that idea because of a variety of reasons. But our first idea of having a good data set of proteins that it cannot be in, mm -hmm. so false positives. If we find it in bacteria, unfortunately, bacteria mimic human proteins. Uh, some bacteria, and in this way, we found interesting cases where mimicking had happened. <laughs> So this is not necessarily the best test, but um, anyway, yes, bacteria 
don't do it. But again, how, let's not, don't think about the organism. Now, I get a paper, an experimental paper, that says this is the motif. Okay, you get the, you are charged with a task to check them out. What would you do? It's very, very simple. Maybe my, my question makes it sound complicated, but it's totally, it's much simpler than you think. Run it on the <coughs> Exactly. So you would run it on the known proteins, right? You would construct a data set of proteins for which you know they're nuclear. And you would construct a set of proteins for which you know they're not nuclear. So the bacterial one could be an example, right? And then we we'll simply see, well, does it match? Where does it match? Now we, nuclear, everything else. Uh, now we sort of complicated the test a little bit. We said, okay, we want to have a set of motifs that are such that they don't only hit in one protein. If it's only one protein, it, it may be specific, but maybe it's too specific. So we wanted to hit at least in two different proteins. Not two different proteins as in mouse, the, the, the particular protein in mouse, the particular protein in human, but two different proteins as in two different families. Two really different things. Okay, that are from the sequence similarity, I cannot say that they most likely have similar sequence, similar structure, uh, similar sequence, similar uh, structure or similar function. Or in fact, that they're both nuclear. I want something because the, the nuclear localization signal is very short. What I did not tell you, you can take uh, one of these, some of the, I can't remember which one, but one of these motifs was taken, and I believe it was a, a, a motif that had something in between, uh, more like this one here, that was put onto a piece of gold. And this short peptide is enough to import the, the gold little piece of gold by a protein into the nucleus. Okay, so you, you stick that onto anything that anything gets into the nucleus. Okay, it has to be small enough. Uh, it has to be a cargo that can be carried by a protein. Uh, but again, so now I want to have this short motif in two different proteins. Then I believe it's a real interesting motif. This is something that is not just evolutionary conservation. This is something that has evolved in completely different families to do the same thing imported to the nucleus. Okay, so that's why I require, I have sorted here into unique families such that every, as I take all the proteins known to be the nuclear, but I take only the subset that are sort of family representatives. Okay? Uh, here I don't do that because anytime I hit, I want to know. Maybe the way I compute is a different story, but. Um, and then what I require is that I have at least two very different proteins that have the signal to accept that. And I require that I, uh, in this particular case, it says I allow one non-nuclear hit. The way I recall the story, we in fact, oh, this is just to make the example that we have three hits, 66% uh, nuclear, so we reject it because we don't allow any hit here. So we want to have motifs that are clearly clear. And lo and behold, none of the experimental motifs we found passed these criteria. Okay? So how can we now change the motifs? Not machine learning, but visually, uh, somebody who has an exper expertise in, in sequence analysis, looks at sequences, how could we... So the problem is that they are either not hitting two different families, that means they are too specific, or that they're hitting non-nuclear proteins, that means they are too generic, too loose. If you hit in the, in the yellow here, you have to make them strict, more strict. If you hit in the green, but only once, you have to make them more loose without going into the yellow. How can you make, do that? Um, I might get the naming wrong a little bit, but uh, the similarity between um, amino acids, there's this similarity. Blossom. Mm -hmm. Blossom. Maybe that could get sounds very good, but I don't understand your idea. It sounds a little bit like I'm the dog, you throw me a bone and I jump. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I ain't gonna jump, Christian. So what do you mean? Um, if, if we know that certain amino acids has to be uh, positively charged and negatively yeah. charged, look at blossom with similarity, which uh, other amino acids have the same are close into those. So that is your motif. Yes. What do you do now? 
look at what you could change, keeping it almost the same in terms of Let's begin with sorry to interrupt you. Let's begin with the example number one. I, the, I hit yellow, so it's not specific enough. What can I do? Shrink it, reduce it, uh, uh, make it smaller. When it's not specific enough? Mm -hmm. Oh, when it's not specific enough. Well, if it's too generic, too general, then just exactly. I believe you got the point, Dimitri. So uh, if it's too specific. You make it shorter. If it's not specific enough, you make it longer. Now, the direction, you can go in that direction. You just look up in the sequence, right? Uh, you could go in that direction and that direction. That's the simplest way of doing it. Uh, and the direction we simply shows by looking at an alignment for, for whatever is conserved. In that way, we, we, we begin to extend. And this way, we simply iterate with a few iterations, with very fast, to make them clearly better. Um, and we got to 214 motifs that, in fact, were such that at the time they did not make a mistake by design. Everything we knew was not nuclear, we did not allow, so sure, they had to be 100%. Um, but impressively, they captured at the time for our data set something like 40%. Uh, that turned out to be not true for the future, so was a, we, we somehow optimized the data set we had. It's like, uh, let's not call it machine learning, but it's certainly a parameter of over-optimization in some sense, the motifs. Uh, we had 200 motifs and they were simply fit to the data set. We also, what else could you try? So this is very manual, right? There's no, no math, no method, no intelligence in here in that sense. How else could you do it? Could you if, you, if you wanted to do it without starting from a data set of experimentally characterized things, could you discover these motifs? The How would you do that? Hmm? You, you could, could like identify regions where you find a lot of positively charged amino Yeah, the, yes, that's true. Uh, so, th yes, you always, I mean, many, many of these have that. <clears throat> uh, in between there are these spacers that makes this slightly uh, rather complicated. But in fact, it didn't work. So it, we, we, we just ran windows of consecutive positive charges. That was not enough. Uh, those we completely ignored. So initially what we were going for were these. But it turns out that you find them very often in other proteins that are not nuclear. Um, <clears throat> so they were not specific enough. That didn't work. What else could you do? Let's get back to this graph of a sketch. Does that sort of give you an idea what you could do? So we started this process here with known motifs. But you could in principle discover motifs, right? You would the criteria are the same for discovering motifs. You just go through your sequence and find anything that, con that fits this criterion. That is such that you find it in two different families that are nuclear, and you don't find it in anything that is not nuclear. And now go and figure. So you can completely exhaustively uh, do this or if, as long as you really don't have spaces in between, as long as you really run windows of, say, 15 or 20 residues, you can possibly hope to, f okay, you will not discover everything, but you may this way find a new motif. We didn't find a single one with that. Then you can look for, in fact, going back into the families, we, we know that this, we assume that when I have this nuclear localization signal in human and the mouse, there will be a similar signal. For many cases that we know, it's actually the case. For many nuclear localization signals that are experimentally characterized, this is exactly what people observe. So that helps us. Now we can simply look for conservation that is slightly positively enriched. We can look up according to some blossom matrix where we have the biochemical or biophysical similarity between amino acids. And then we can have a motif finder. Again, it failed. In our hands, it failed. It doesn't, I still don't understand why that doesn't work. Um, and something somehow similar did work, and we will talk about that next week. 
but the simple one clearly failed. Um, what it turned out was another thing here. When we looked at one of those examples, does anybody recognize what you see? So the gray part here is a protein. This is the nuclear localization signal. Anybody has an idea what this could be, this brownish ochre color? Yes, it's DNA, exactly. So you see that the nuclear localization signal, the part of the nuclearization signal in this particular protein, binds exactly into the major, in the, in the, uh, major groove of the DNA. And now we get back to the point that I made. DNA is, positive, is negatively charged. So the positive charges bind exactly into the DNA. Why does that make sense? Well, actually you have a beautiful cycle. Uh, and step one, so you have something that is positively charged, relatively on the surface. That something is recognized by an importin, so that you, that you as a protein are important to the nucleus. In the nucleus, m most of the material in the nucleus is really DNA. Many proteins in the nucleus bind DNA. In fact, that's the entire trick of the idea of compartmentalization in, in eukaryotes, that you have specific functions in specific subcompartments. Okay? Uh, and that means that the importing goes off once you're inside. You still have this positive charge. That positive charge binds DNA, negatively charged. At some point, you are released from the DNA through competitive binding to the same site with another protein that will be exporting you. And you're free to a new cycle. Right? Import, export material in a perfect cycle that always uses the same zip code to bind, to get in and out. Okay? And for many proteins, this works exactly this way. Now, the story that this IDP project did is to simply update this database. So that database was done 15 years ago, update the database by other uh, characterized databases and make sure that again what we put into our database is sort of clean by this step that it does not match to proteins that are non-nuclear. And we still don't really have a generic prediction method except for the one that I talk about next week uh, on Thursday. Um, okay, now let's get back to the, the problem, the de novo prediction, the global signal. So again, the idea behind all of that goes back to Günther Blobel, who got the Nobel Prize for that idea, which is in fact that the regulation is done through signals. Now, let's step back in bacteria, essentially, in some sense, you can imagine this like a bag. And the bag, again, is a solid, more like a solid state. But now, for the time being, imagine the bag to be a bag of fluid, a plastic bag filled with water. Again, it's more like a solid state, but just keep this image for, for the time being. And all that you have to do in this cell is sort of swimming in this water. All right? Now, the problem is that in order to have the proteins that bind DNA and that have to do the, the things with the DNA be next to that DNA, you need some regulation to just get the right proteins in the vicinity. And you need to be very careful that no other protein messes up that binding to DNA story. The, the sort of advanced step is you take everything out here and put it into different bags. One bag does anything that has to do with DNA and that you put into the middle of the cells to also protect it. One bag does everything that has to do with energy. You sort of distribute that. Uh, so you have different functions, commodimeritization. Now you, of course, now you have the freedom to just have to bring everything to the right place, into the right bag. So you somehow move the information problem to the one of transport. Okay, and that's the zip code idea here. And the question really is, how do we see this information? We talked about signal peptides for secretion, that's N-terminal. I said that the same thing somehow happens for mitochondria. Um, there are motifs that, this one doesn't have a chloroplast, oh, this is a thing that has everything. Um, so there's a chloroplast motif here. And I showed you some of the nucleus issues. 
So maybe the entire transport is done that way. Okay, today we still do not know the signals for actually most of the proteins. What does it mean? So it may mean that uh, many, 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 many signals remain to be discovered. Okay? And 10 years ago or 15 years ago when we started in this field, this was an absolutely viable possible way of looking at it. Now 10 years or 15 years later, to me this begins to be less unlikely. Maybe there are other types of motifs. So one way I already said these conformational motifs here that are very difficult to recognize from sequence alone. We still don't have structures for everything and we still have not found a good way to do a motif discovery on 3D structures for these kinds of zip codes. Again, we have several people have tried that, we have so far failed. Doesn't mean there's not a path, we still just haven't found a path yet. Uh, but maybe there are other mechanisms. Can you think about another mechanism that sort of makes the zip code become an important idea but us still unable to explain everything because there's something else going on? Can you sort of think about zip plus a little bit complication that would explain why some signals are hidden? So why some proteins may be imported into the nucleus without having a nuclear localization signal? How could you imagine that? Huh? Maybe those motifs only merge up to interaction of several proteins. Yes, well, <coughs> yes, but you are, this, this, your way, way, that's a step ahead. I mean something much simpler, but it involves the interaction of uh, several proteins. So assume that this protein here is a zip, a zip code. It binds the shuttle protein, right? And that another protein binds to it. This one doesn't have a zip code, but simply bound to that. Since that binds the shuttle, this one is so co-shuttled. It's not quite what you said. Your, your idea is really that the zip code evolves just like a conformational motif because these two proteins bind and then the zip code somehow is at the interface. That could be the case too. Uh, but this is a much simpler way, right? Uh, these we have found some. The, the one you uh, described we haven't found, but that doesn't mean anything because, let me go back, even for this there's still no experimental proof that this is absolutely existing. So there, there is evidence that some motifs are like that, but there's also doubt about the ver veracity. I said that when two nuclear motifs come together, it is sort of like that. But since there's, you saw these, these positively charged motifs, there are still local patches of positive charges. It's not quite this one, really. Uh, so even that one is not completely proven experimentally, so your idea would be much more complicated to prove. There's, 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 I have not seen any evidence for that. This sort of thing we know. Uh, now, then the, 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 the problems, the task then simply would be find all secondary cargo. So describe all the nuclear localization signals, that those are the nuclear proteins, and then find every protein that binds to it, and then the question would be, does that explain? The, the zip code idea. And can we somehow, is the question, estimate how many secondary cargos uh, there could be? And that, in fact, is a project that we haven't really, I believe it's a, it, it, that is doable. But there's no answer for that at the moment. Um, and the answer for that, the problem really is that we still don't have a complete map of all the protein interactions. Over the course of the remainder of my lecture, I will talk more about protein interactions, and you will see that today we still are very far away from for every single human protein knowing what that one binds to. Very far away from that. In fact, for most human proteins, we still have no idea what they bind to. And that begins to be immediately the dent in this picture. Uh, just imagine, if, uh, just say with a number, if for most proteins we don't know the binding partner, so say 50%, uh, then is today we can, I can't remember, describe with nuclear electrization signals something in the ballpark of maybe a fifth of all the proteins. Okay, the fifth of all the proteins, okay, half of the binders we don't know. Okay, now we have 50% gum. Uh, of the 50% we can 20 or 50, we can describe. A uh, factor of two, give or take, could be, right, without even looking. 
uh, when you see that everyone has a binding partner, the story becomes more... What I'm trying to say here, you can immediately come up with some hand-waving, but it's not convincing. It's not really nailing the story. You can do the hand-waving even without looking. And if you can explain the observations without putting some numbers down, except for very trivial numbers that you can put in the back of an envelope in two seconds, then this is sort of dangerous. You, you ought to be careful. But I do believe we can do that a little bit better. Um, and this is another project for, for somebody. While we cannot really do all the nuclearization signals, all the signals of the, all the zip codes, uh, we still want to predict subcellular localization. And what could be a simple way to predict subset localization de novo. And again, now in my simplest way, I have a sort of three state classes. And in the three state classes, we have nuclear, cytoplasmic, extracellular. So any idea? How could we predict subset localization? So again, yes, zip code may be the truth, but I don't know the zip code. I give up on the zip code story for the time being because I get only so far. I, I believe at this point, I've done everything I could with zip codes. I told you already I don't believe that, but let's assume that. Uh, and I do want to have a method tomorrow that uses some other signal. We have looked at evolutionary conservation. We have done that, used that. We have looked at all the motifs that we know, signal peptides, nuclearization signals, and the like. What else could we do? So we can look up at a more global signal on the level of the sequence. How could we do that to predict subset localization? Well, we could look at secondary structure. Because yes, we can do. So it has to go through the membrane and try yes. to bring proteins that tend to have this mushroom like structure. Ah, that's an interesting um, that's an interesting point, yes. But just like in the case of the nuclear localization signal, the protein that is shuttled through the nuclear pore neither has to be hydrophobic nor in, the second, in your idea or in this idea of the secondary cargo the secondary cargo doesn't even have to have a motif so what I'm saying is you have a pore and you can put anything through there this does not have to have a membrane helix because it's actually not really contacting the protein that actively does the transport that, <laughs> that may for, for that one it may be important but not the one that is shuttled okay yeah? In this regard, are they similar to the ones lying on the external nucleus of the cell? Is there some known... So that's what I said. So the sequence signal for similarity, done. So we, uh, we, we have homology. Remember I had this slide where I said we can do it by homology, we can do it by text mining, uh, we can do it by motifs. And we have methods for all of these. All of them are done. We still, we still don't have a method that predicts everything. What else could we do? We can have a look on, on the pores. Yes. If, uh, pores are holes. Excuse me? Pores are holes. I'm overstating my case. But they are still enzymes. I mean, no, pores are not enzymes. No, pores are really, uh, so there are two different types of pores, but they really, you uh, imagine them, so there are these uh, lipid tails and lipid head groups that, that form this, this, this lipid bilayer here. And into this lipid bilayer, in 3D, you really insert a hole. This hole is in fact something that is spanned by alpha helices that are along this uh, lipid bilayer, the wall, the membrane. And they really punch a hole. That's one transport mechanism. It's not all. So the, there are many other transport mechanisms. Some of them are really such that you possibly could recognize the cargo. Uh, but this is one. Certainly for nuclear, they, they look exactly like that. But my question earlier was, maybe it wasn't clear. Are they like the holes that we find in, uh, in bacteria, which are simply holes? Or are they like the ones we find in... So for the nucleus, yes, they are just like that. OK, so it's just like tofu. Uh, the story is more complicated, and I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm telling you, I'm, in order to 
get you to the right path, I'm saying things that are not quite defendable if you ask too many questions. Um, I'm trying to deflect your ideas in, in a different direction. But still, so strictly speaking, it's true what I'm saying, although I'm beginning to lie to you. This whole, the, the, the whole way you just have a whole way everything falls through is a, little, a strong oversimplification. But we failed so far to use the motif of the whole. Let's, let's put it like that. Okay, well that's going to be yes. much simpler. Everything that is small goes through. Hmm? You could say that everything that is small can could possibly ah. be Oh. No, so uh, again, so we have what we want to distinguish is nuclear, cytoplasmic, and out. And if you just classify it by length, then they look very similar. So that one is out. We could try to identify the use of the protein, the target, which is... Uh, ah, that's a great idea. The problem with that idea is we sort of turn things around. Uh, I described, let me put that into perspective, I was not clear about that. The reason why I bring subcellular localization first in the lecture about predicting function is because of all the features of function. This is the simplest in the sense that I have a very the enzymatic activity I can put into numbers, but these numbers have some problems. The function I could put into Go numbers, but these numbers have some problems. Where protein is, is easy to observe. And there's no problem with the annotation. And it tells you something about function. If it's nuclear, just a sec, uh, yeah, um, it binds DNA. It, it's not a high level of information about function, but it helps me. So, and since it's, bless you, it's relatively simpler, simple, I want to begin there. Okay? But now, using the function, I would sort of turn this idea upside down. Um, if you go for the efficiency of, of a protein or the... I mean, they are three different like, media, so mm -hmm. proteins would fall differently or would have more would function differently in each back to that. We get back to that point. So they will look different. Um, so just to in fact derail you on that idea, you're onto something. Just because uh, at this point I want to derail you and get you in a different direction. If I look at all the three-dimensional structures and I classify them, then they look very similar between these three classes as overall classified faults. But that's sort of misleading. You're onto something very interesting. Uh, but this, in fact, is what people did. They classified them according to their types of folds and found that the classification does not help to group and gave up on that idea. But that idea really led to something. Uh, it's just not that simple. Something much simpler, guys. The beginning to be... Yeah, but so uh, what else is you have 20 amino acids, now go. You guys, you, I expect you to be rather thinking in terms of machine learning than in terms of biology. Well, in terms of machine learning, of course, we can build the data set, ah. observed proteins that we already know, ah. well, they exactly are localized. Yeah. So what is now your input? And now my input would be a sequence of a new protein that I want to pinpoint. How? Oh, how do you put a sequence in there? Hmm? Okay, so far so good. Simplest way, sequence. Can somebody give me an idea how we can put this code for the sequence? Pardon? Could you repeat? How can we sequence, so you have, uh, say, a thousand proteins here, a thousand proteins here, and a thousand proteins here. Let's just call that extracellular. Because um, many of the slides will have this X. Uh, and you want a machine learning device that classifies according to your, you have the sequence. What of the sequence? How are you going to put the sequence into a machine learning device? There's a string of characters. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Really? So we have the data set. Of really? How do you do that? Proteins are 30 to 30,000 residues long. How do you put a string of characters 
into a machine learning device. Which machine learning device? What do you think so about? Need to identify the mines? I don't know. I'm asking you. Yeah, come on. I, I want your idea. And <laughs> don't ask me how you do it. If you really want to do it with the complete sequence, then you can hash it somehow. How? How would you hash it? You could use uh, the, not the amino acid, but certain features of those amino acids, like uh, their charge or uh, and then what did whatever. You, and but how would that help you with this problem? You would reduce the. Okay, so then the number would be uh, ten to ten thousand. The problem is not the number. The problem is the this the span. So again. Think about, let's, let's look at uh, an SVM uh, neural network or these simple things. They don't like anything like from 10 to 20. Let's not talk about 10 to 10,000. Windows. You have to split down. Okay, now we, are, now we are talking. So looking at a window of, say, 20 consecutive residues. So far, what I talked about in terms of motifs, would that be a good idea? Do you remember? Yes. It would be. This, remember the signal pep that has a hydrophobic stretch, just like a membrane helix. That's not what you want. It jumps up every, every time it sees a hydrophobic stretch and says what? Some of them are membrane helices, some of them are signal peptides, some of them will not really do the classification. Run a window through the whole sequence and then won't? Whole sequence, what do you mean? Ah! Well, so, it's like this window. Yes, or yes, kind of results. Okay, now, now, now. Do you see the problem with that? We're again in the range here. Even, even if I, for simplicity, cut off and say it's just uh, 30 to uh, 300 residues, even in that one order of magnitude. Uh, and say the window is 10. In one case, you have 3. And one only have 30. The average, the product that you average over is something very different. And that you have to be careful with in machine learning. It may work, but you have to really understand your tool in order to it's, it is a it's a fairly dramatic process because the information content intrinsically of what you put in, and one you have an average over just three ten MERS. Another one of, of uh, uh, 30 ten mers, and this is really from the information content something very different. And th that means essentially what you what you do is you make it very difficult for the machine learning device to see the pattern. Most likely, it will zoom into doing something that you implicitly meant, Christian. Sort of do go, go on more. Maybe there's some length correlation that it sees, which when you look at length alone, there may be some signal, but it's not really the biophysical signal. Okay. So the sliding window may work, but not in the, in the way of, of sliding it through and averaging. Again, I'm going to present a sliding window-like approach. Um, but the simple way didn't work. It took us many years to come up with an idea how to, to make that work. And I, I want something simpler. Think about something totally simple. What's the simplest thing you can do? The simplest? Yeah. You don't do it. That, that is not what I meant. Uh, the simplest thing that, you, that could possibly, where you, where you have an input device, where you put something into the, from the sequence, uh, want to classify in three classes, the first simplest thing you can look at, the simplest feature you can look at. There's a mode of a sequence. The most frequent amino acid responsible. Oh. This is, this is an interesting idea. So we are, we are talking about an input space of 20 units. We have 20 amino acids. Uh, and one of them, essentially, what the most extreme way that you suggest now would be uh, 19 zeros and 1 1. That is the most extreme one. And I have never seen anybody try that. That could actually even work. I don't know. Uh, okay, you uh, you're completely answered to my question. Think about the simplest, and I never thought about it. Um, this is a great idea for a simple one. I don't know whether it's going to work. Uh, slide step up from there. Yeah, 
you know, you just have 20 units and look at the amino acid composition, right? So you would see somehow implicitly you had an idea in there. Uh, you just didn't sort of work it through. The, you had the idea of a reduction. But in principle, the idea in the background of your head was the one of uh, enrichment of positively charged residues, right? And in the amino acid composition, you see an enrichment. Maybe in the amino acid composition, you see a signal. And that, in fact, is exactly uh, what Kinta Nakai, uh, Minoru Kanaisha, published here in 88 already as, uh, as the first methods that predicted subcellular localization. Um, now, and there's a more recent version from Paul Horton here, PSORT, that in fact is one of the best methods to predict subcellular localization. It uses much, much more than that. Uh, but that was the original idea. Now, the question brings us back to what, what Muriel uh, or Christina uh, said or suspected. Do you really believe that claim? So the question is, if that were true, so if amino acid would be a signal, then there would be a biophysical reason why the overall amino acid composition would matter. Okay, we have seen the positive charges. But the problem with that, in some sense, is we average over very different scales. So a patch of positive charges, like 10 residues, is a local enrichment of positive charges. It may not be the true that for the entire protein of, of 5,000 residues, there's an enrichment to be seen, right? It's a very local thing. And for the, with the gold story, I told you that the local enrichment is, is, more than, is enough for you. So you don't really need to have a lot of positive charges in the entire thing. For short proteins, it most likely works better. But is there anything else that is a concern? And that brings us to some extent to something that Christina said. Since you said it, since I attribute the idea to you, can you piece it together? No, you're not, not, you don't understand why I, well, why I blame you for that, yeah? You have to look if uh, the, the positively charged regions are on the outside of the proteins. Yes, that's exactly the idea I was fishing for. Uh, and Christina, you said that initially. Uh, so say there were different pH values, so different environments. The amino acid composition of the protein is not seeing the environment, only the surface is, right? Okay, let's just look at how that translates. Uh, when we do, and that is work from Miguel Andrade, uh, this is an eigenvector decomposition. So first eigenvalue, largest eigenvalue, second largest eigenvalue, all residues. These slides are old, I'm sorry for the quality. Uh, I don't even... Red, I believe, is cytoplasmic, and you cannot even see it here. Uh, maybe a lie. I believe the blue is extracellular. Maybe red is cytoplasmic. This is the way I remember it. And this light green here is nuclear. So somehow you may appreciate that there is sort of a clustering. There's more red here. There's more blue here. There's some cluster of green. And there's here clearly an overlap region. Okay? This is simply all 20 amino acids. They cluster. Okay, now what we want to do it, uh, we want to look at the core residues, the ones inside, and the signal goes away. In contrast, when we look at the surface residues, the signal gets stronger. Again, nuclear is this green, there are points here green that are wrong, uh, but now the blue is pretty much away from here, and most of it, or a lot, is really taken apart. Uh, so that's the point that when we look at structure on top, or some particular aspect of structure, it's not classification or helix or something like that, but it's what the surface composition looks like, then you begin to clearly see a signal. It's not that all amino acids help you, but the surface residues do. Okay? Now, uh, interesting what we, interestingly, what we saw at some point here is we had... Uh, Miguel saw, in this particular case, extracellular proteins that are right in... Okay. Um, the, in the middle of this cytoplasmic, large cytoplasmic cluster, you have E's. So, uh, they are in completely the wrong compartment. 
when he looked at the most extreme outliers, he saw they were all glycosylated. So essentially you have something on the surface that mimics a different compartment. And the way you can survive is you put a sugar on top and you change your surface. So that completely explained this. In fact, this is a way in, pro in which proteins, so sugars are put on and off proteins. And this is a mechanism by which signaling is done. So that means something is going to do, happen to you. It's like a flag ready for processing. And it is a way to survive in a different compartment. So in this sense, it was a beautiful story. Overall, then when we looked at the surface residues, we saw that there is a clear signal. And that signal can be used to predict. Now, uh, it correlates with surface composition. Hence, we want to now use a method that uses amino acid composition, but amino acid surface composition uh, to predict subcellular localization. And the work initially was done by Regis Nayer. Um, what, uh, what the problem here, again, um, let's, let's begin with the, with the problem of the story. The problem of the story is, and this is unpublished, um, when Regish looked at it, I can't remember when he did that, that may have been 99 or 2000, uh, the clustering according to the first eigenvectors of uh, all amino acids and surface now the coloring is black, uh, green is still nuclear, but extracellular is from blue to red, and dark is what used to be red. Uh, so these are the two views that clearly differed before, and they no longer did differ. And this induced Rajesh into believing that using solvent accessibility wouldn't help in the prediction. Now, let's get back or let's not get back, let's, let's have a quick run through the idea behind neural networks and uh, support vector machines. You're familiar with that? Have you seen neural networks? What's the idea behind it? So it's, I have both answers. Um, so that means I'm going to go through it. And whoever said no now, stop me when I'm too fast. Okay? So. Neural network is a term, and begin with a neural network, uh, a term used for different things. What I'm talking about now is the simplest way of doing it, which is a feed forward network. In the feed forward network, you have one layer, the input layer, uh, and you have another layer, the output layer. There are values here, uh, unit has a value of one, and there are connections between these two. Okay? And there's uh, the information is processed, so you, this typical and simplest way of doing that is you multiply the value that gets in with the value here, with the connection. Somehow the signal strength that goes through the wire, the thickness of the wire is one way of imagining it. Uh, and that is what this one here integrates, so it simply sums this times that plus this times that. That's the input. Now you need a nonlinear decision not a linear decision, you do by having a function such as the hyperbolical tangents or in this particular case is the uh, invert e, e, e function, exponential function. So something that when you have as input here very highly positive values it will be to one, it will set to one. If it's very very negative values here it will set to zero and something in between. Okay. Now the first step the multiplication of a vector, essentially what you do is you multiply two vectors with one another. The vector formed by these connections and the vector formed by the input. A simple operation. Okay, that's the analogous situation. This one here is analogous to making a decision. The product is it larger or smaller than some value. That's the entire operation. So with that operation, you can separate out points by introducing a line. Let me give you an example. Say this is, the, this is a white dot here and this is a dark dot and you want the neural network to separate these two types of dots. Say this is my first input state here. Uh, one and zero is one as it should be. Then a connection of one is a positive feedback. This is right. You, you, you want this to be, say, switched to one. Uh, so for this particular case now you compute what's the error. 
So you compute one times one, and then you do that the hyperbolic tangents or something like that. And what you want, say is this is a one and this is a zero. So that's the mistake that you make. In order to reduce the mistake, you simply, that's the error versus the connections here, you somehow find a way to walk down uh, the hill. So you go toward reduction of error with every single change of your connections. So now over time what you're going to do is you're going to flip the connections according to the points you see. Okay? You're going to present input examples. You know for each input example what the output will be. And every single time that you make a mistake, you, s you adjust the connection such that the mistake is going to go towards less. Okay? You reduce the error. Uh, so in this particular case here, you train the, uh, the mistake and then ultimately what you do is you introduce a line in space. All of these lines here would validly do the trick. There's in principle, absolutely not in principle, there's absolutely no difference. All lines that I show make zero mistakes. All lines are equal, so equally valid solutions. And if you retrain the neural network again and again, you will find these, some of these different lines. If you do it often enough, you will sample all the possible lines. Uh, now, the way, in fact, that there is a random stochastic procedure is twofold. First, you begin with a, connection, a set of connections. You initialize the connections. Okay. And how you start may decide whether you end up here or here. And the way you present your samples may be important. Uh, that's the stochastic difference between this line and that line. All lines here mean end of, end of training because you make no mistake. Okay? Uh, so far so clear in principle? What about this problem? Can you separate that by a line? This problem couldn't be solved until the 80s, I believe, or, or the 90s. The, uh, that is a good repetition of something that you have read. Look at the problem. <laughs> Can you see a line? Why not? Because it's... Uh, there is a line. It's multidimensional though. Hmm? It's multidimensional though. A line is one dimension. I mean, I mean that's just a one straight line that, that just have like... So far, I didn't say straight line, right? <laughs> Guys, keep thinking out of the box. It is true. So the, the, the way algorithmically you project two vectors, it's a straight line, essentially. The geometry of the problem is a straight line. So you're totally right. Uh, so this is not allowed by a vector. You cannot do that. Vector multiplication essentially does a, a, a straight line. But you could also do it. Oops. By two straight lines, but also, but with two straight lines, you could do it. In the language of the neural network, essentially, you introduce a second line, and now uh, this is. I, I motivate something. Strictly not true. It's just blah, that sounds good. But essentially, you bring a second line by bringing in another layer, and with that layer, you. This is the so called hidden layer, so it's still input. Output is called hidden because it's sort of for the processing of the neural network, but it's not visible to the world. Uh, and now, essentially, this is like two lines. In fact, it's not quite true, but the number of hidden units increases the complexity of the space or the type of hyperplane that you introduce. So we're no longer talking about lines, we're talking about hyperplanes, and you essentially blow the story up into a high dimensional space. In the higher dimensional space, you find a separation. Having more hidden units, you introduce the dimensionality of the hyperplane that separates the point. That part is true. So two is like two lines in that analogy. But we're no longer, the analogy of a single line, a second line is, is misleading. But it's highly complex. Uh, hyperplanes that you create by blowing up the complexity. Okay, and again, uh, in this two, uh, oh, I didn't talk about that. Why not? Um, it, now, oh, it's down here. Uh, in terms of computation, by adding another layer, you do the same thing as before. So this unit still has state of that times connection as input then the hyperbolic tangles or something like that as output. This one, the output from here times that connection 
plus the output from here times that connection is the input here. Hyperbolic entangles is the output. That's the, uh, the story here. So that's essentially going the first one, that's going the second layer here, and that's the output unit. In this particular case, we have only one. Uh, the error is compiled the same way as before, and the reduction or the uh, way you could reduce the error, you train the neural network is simply you go downhill. Downhill is a gradient descent. That's what this one says. So that's the error with respect to the connections, uh, the, uh, the derivative of the error with respect to the junction uh, connections is in fact the change of a connection at one time point t. Now, what this one says here, without that one here, what this one says is go downhill. Okay, go downhill can get trapped. You need to push upwards again. That's the, people call that the momentum term. That is from the time before that allows you uphill moves. As simple as that, okay? Essentially, you simply, at every single time point, you look how you can reduce the connections to solve the, the, the last sample that you have seen. And then you sometimes walk up to not get trapped in local minima, problem solved. Very, very simple. Uh, now, the next issue here, what I show training time, uh, what I show here is the accuracy for my training set. And, and uh, my training set is in green. And in blue, I would have the test set, the set that is not used to optimize parameters. And what you see here is overtraining. So we reach a point beyond which what I do is only valid for the training set. It's like learning by, by heart, right? Now, what can I do to prevent that from happening? Do not uh, use the training set that much to achieve such high level of performance because the high hour performance... So stop before. before. Uh, this is what people typically refer to early stop. Uh, decide to stop somewhere. How, where do you stop? We stop when our performance on the testing set uh, starts decreasing. So that means essentially whenever this goes down. Is that valid? Well, it's, it's, I think it's more complex than this nice uh, curve. Because we get back to that. True. But assume, let's first work out the, the solution on the pseudo problem. On the imagined simple solution. Uh, you don't understand the, what we are training? No, I mean, how can you overtrain something? I mean, I don't know. Okay, so um, we have a, this is our problem here, right? And say I have uh, 333 of this, 333 of these, and 333 of these. Uh, I have 999. Well, okay, I forget about the details. I have 1,000 proteins, okay? and they fall somehow equally into all classes. Magically, one disappears. Um, and there is no redundancy. All the data is sort of fine. All of these problems I don't want to talk about now. Now, my thousand proteins, I cannot all use for training. Because then I don't know how well I actually do, right? So I have to take the thousand and take some output that's called a testing and some out for training. And that in this graph here is green and blue. And now we can take your point out too. And then we can take out too. Okay? So, in principle, for the training set, I try everything to fit my training set. Everything I fit my training set means going back into the principal idea of it, I go downhill as long as I can. I go downhill until I don't make an error anymore. Okay? And that is what I see here. I keep training. But what I see when I look at the test set is that I no longer perform as well as I do there. There's a max. This max is overtraining. Why did it happen? Is somehow you hope that this machine learning device extracts generic rules about your problem. But it turns out that is an interpretation now. It turns out at some point 
what you learn is not generic anymore. What you learn is valid only for your training set. That you do that, you cannot see in the difference between blue and red, uh, green. The fact that blue and green differ may yet be a different story. We would interpret this figure to mean that if I stopped, as Dimitri said, if I stopped at this point, we avoid overtraining. Mind you, at this point still, the training set is, is learned better than the test set. So there is still some sort of overtraining going on. Uh, it's, as Dimitri said, but that is not what he meant, uh, it is more complex than, than I put it here. Uh, and it's a longer story, this one. I'm ignoring that. But the part that is important really is I have to stop training to prevent overtraining. Or one way of, of uh, preventing me from running into this problem is by stopping. Now the question is, how do I decide where to stop? Dimitri says, well, let's take the blue one and decide whenever the blue, blue reaches its maximum, I stop. And that is not valid. Why not? Because we cannot test it. Then we miss a test set. Because a test set is supposed to be an independent set. If I use my independent data set to adjust my free parameters, then it's no longer an independent data set. It's a data set that I used. <coughs> So training testing is cross-validation. You split it into a training set and a testing set, and you call that cross-validation. Or what do you mean? Yeah, I thought we were supposed to split the training, uh, the training set in, say, five pieces, and then just rotate. That, that again, 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 again. So you now talk about a level of detail we didn't talk about. So we could imagine you say five, you like the number five, blah, 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 blah. How do I do that? It's 800, 200, and then I rotate five times around. So I do five of those, right? That's the way to do it. So in a cross validation experiment, and Dimitri is right. Okay, let me put that down. Uh, say, Okay, I don't like uh, five mers. I, I like it four mers. It's easier for me to show. Um, uh, there's no blue. So, okay, this is blue. I am blue. This is the big blue. Uh, so, now what I have to do, this is my neural network number one. My neural network number two will be here. My neural network number three will be here, and my neural network number four will be here. And then I will average over those. Because what I have to do is I have to use every single protein once for training and for testing. Okay? That's part of cross-validation, that's part of using the entire package around, and that's very important. It's important what the difference between these two data sets is, between training and testing, you cannot allow any overlap. Overlap means, in our case, overlap is defined as if you have enough sequence similarity, I can use homology directly. I don't need my machine learning device. So the degree to which I can do homology-based inference defines what is too much overlap here. The fact that I, an additional complication was that I had to put all of these numbers out at front. They, they were not known before we did this. Um, but anyway, so in this particular case, this is what so far I believe you said. Stop for every one of those, and the Christian says this is not enough because if we stop on these four data sets, we decide four times when to stop the four training processes at the optimal four different blues. Again, that will be at different points for different neural networks, right? Uh, but in each one of those cases, I will use the test set that is supposed to be hidden under the table while development is happening, and I'm using it. So what else can I do? Now you said cross-validation. In principle you're right, but the, the historical way of seeing cross-validation is this, and that is not enough. There must be a third class. There must be a third set. Evaluation. Exactly. So we could, could have this as, as uh, again, there, there's a confusion in the, in the world about calling one test set, one validation set. Uh, I, don't, I don't like it for me. I personally like the idea of training and cross-training. And that makes it clear, and then there's testing. Uh, and for me, this is very intuitive that both of those have somehow to do with training. So in this particular case here, this would be a cross-training set. Uh, and here, maybe this would be a cross-training set. Here, this would be the cross-training set. And here, now I have to find one that I haven't used yet. Uh, this one would be the cross-training set. 
And then I used the cross-training set, so the blue would no longer be the test set, the blue would now be the cross-training data set, and then I can use the test set, because I've never used it so far, and determine how well we do. Uh, okay, so one problem that we, we did with this sort of neural network was running a window to predict secondary structure. Uh, so this is the window approach uh, that you talked about, where we have, in this particular case, 13 consecutive residues, and we run through the protein. And for that, since that was a secondary structure as a local feature, there's no information content problem, because you don't average over them. You just predict for one local window. And the content information is always the same. So that's the type of problem that is ideal for windows going through. Uh, now, in this particular problem, here, is the test, and here's the training. It's a reiteration of uh, what Dimitri said. Yes, there is sort of a maximal value. Yes, there's overtraining. But it's just not as pronounced, not as simple as my, my toy example that I put there. But all the ideas are still valid. Uh, it only means that in practice it's even more complicated. You have to be really careful. Uh, and I will, over the course of my lecture, give you other examples how, how you have to be careful. Okay, now let's get into the other thing there, uh, support vector machine. Any, any idea what the big difference is between a support vector machine and a neural network? So, what they both begin with is they look at an original problem and a transform problem. The transformation is simply blowing up the solution. And the blowing up of the solution here done through some function, they're done through hidden units, essentially you blow up this space. That idea is exactly the same. Uh, it also has the same idea of introducing a hyperplane. SVMs are completely like neural network. The math behind it, or a lot of the, the, the essential math behind it of physics is the same. Now here's the big difference. Uh, the neural network would train on all of these points. The red ones one class, the green stars into another class. The SVM says, okay, listen, these are trivial, okay? I don't have to train on those. Any simple machine learning device will pick them up. What is more crucial is that I distinguish the ones that are close to the decision line, okay? So I will zoom into Distinguishing points that on one end are red, on the other hand are green, so they're very close to each other, but in different classes. So let's not classify all the points equally, let's zoom onto the boundary points. Let's classify those right. Okay? That's the support vectors spanning these two lines. Again, within uh, two extreme lines here. Within the margin, just like for the neural networks, there are different solutions that define the same, or that realize the same concept, that separate, in this particular case, the two red, uh, green from the two red ones here. All of these lines do. Within this margin, all of these solutions are the same. Okay. All right? Um, now, uh, let me put it in a, in a very different context before I get into the detailed question of difference between SVM and neural network. And that goes back to a talk that uh, Teresa Wirt gave. And that's the idea behind machine learning. Uh, I like this. So some of you may have encountered this issue of the alarm clock hitting you in the morning and not be considered by the waking up character as a friend. Uh, and some of you also have sort of seen that this is not always the same. So sometimes the alarm clock wakes you up in a way that you feel good and sometimes you do not appreciate the alarm clock that much. And you know, one explanation for what's the difference between these two uh, could, for instance, be how many hours have you been awake on the day before? Okay, uh, and then you can begin to simply do an experiment and simply, you know, for various days you count when you were happy, when you were bad, and you relate that on the axis of the hours that you counted. But then you see, you know, sometimes this is not quite explaining the story. There's an overlap, right? The axis is not explaining that. So you immediately realize it's not the only thing you need to know. You can look, for instance, at uh, the hours of sleep that you got. 
Uh, and then you begin to see that on these two features, you see a separation. And that essentially is the, the idea behind machine learning. And the idea is in a neural network you increase the number of hidden units, you increase the input space. In an SVM, you begin with the right input space and you blow it up into a separation space, so to speak. But other than that, the different features, the input features, they define whether you can solve the problem or not. Okay? The machine learning device it's just finding different paths to the solution. But it can never find a solution that is not written in your input space. So if you cannot separate the problem, if you did not pick up the right features, you cannot solve it. Okay? The problem is, now you could argue, well, uh, in this particular case here, uh, you can, the line, I forgot the line. Uh, you could argue, I'm going to throw whatever feature I have at the problem. What's the problem of that? To be on the safe side, you just invent all possible features, blow up your input space as much as you can, and then you will hopefully find a way to separate the problem. What's the danger of that? Well, the more input features you have, no matter what the device is, the more free parameters you will have. The more you put in things that are not relevant, the more data you need in order to balance that. There's always a balance effect between the number of free parameters and the, and the number of uh, cases that you learn. Okay? So you have to be careful sometimes. Um, now, back to the issue... Oh, this goes into the binary classification. Um, so differences between SVMs and, and neural networks, so the words are different, underneath the, the principal idea of the math is very simple. It's eigenvector decomposition. Uh, it's some eigenvalue problems. It's, it's the same math of physics. It comes from physics because essentially this is a way of handling uh, matrices that, that is very known to... It's a matrix inversion problem, essentially, that is used in physics a lot. Um, now, other than the similarity in the math, the differences... There are two major differences. One is the binary classification issue. So SVMs intrinsically are binary classifiers. The neural networks, I could have three output units. It doesn't have to be binary. Okay? Uh, this is one important problem. Now, in this important problem, I'm not entirely sure how my, my talk now I changed the way uh, it is. There's another problem that I want to keep in my head. We go back to this on Thursday. Because I promised you 10 minutes of questions and I'm already, I already lied to you. I forgot. <laughs>